place I would rather be. No place I would rather be than here in your love, here in your love. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be than here in your love, here in your love. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. I want more of you. Darkness now has ended in the kingdom of light. In the kingdom of light, forever under your dominion, your 
the king of my life. You're the king of my life. You reign above it all. You reign above it all. Over the universe and over every heart, there is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. You poured out your life Just to give us new life Now from the lips of the forgiven Hear an anthem arise Cause Jesus, you're alive oh, You reign above it all You reign above it all Over Everyone, happy Easter. Let's stand together and sing. I believe. I believe there is one salvation, one doorway that leads to life, one redemption, one confession. I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe, I believe in the crucifixion and set free. I believe in the resurrection. Hallelujah, his life is destiny. All praise, all praise to God the Father, all praise to Christ the Son. All praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome. The King who was and is and evermore will be. In Jesus' mighty name, I believe. I believe in the hope of heaven. I believe in the hope of heaven. He's preparing a place for me. Far beyond what hearts imagine, ears have heard or eyes have seen. I believe that a day is coming. He's returning to claim his bride. Light the altar, keep it burning. See the lamb rose a roaring light. God the Father, all praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome, the King who was and is and evermore will be, in Jesus' mighty name I believe. never be ashamed of the gospel. No, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? Again. No, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life. One more time. Oh no, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? All praise to God the Father. All praise to Christ the Son. All praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome. The King who was and is and evermore will be, in Jesus' mighty name, I believe. Sing it once more. All praise to God our Father, all praise to Christ the Son.
Amen. Hey, good morning. It is so glad to have you here with us at First Christian Church. If you are new with us, maybe it's your first time here, and that's very likely there are at least some of you here today. We want especially for you to feel welcome here today. Uh, we have a gift that we'd like to give to you, so before you leave, make sure you stop by our welcome desk outside these doors. and We'd love to give that to you to show our appreciation for you being here. Uh, we'd also love it if you'd fill out a connection card, and that goes for everybody, because not only do we want to know that you were here with us today, but we also want to know what we can be praying for you about. We take great joy in doing that for you, so make sure you fill those out. You know, there's a lot of ways to worship here, one in which we just participated by singing, and there's so many more, and one of those other ways is through giving. And if you have come here prepared to do that today, there's a couple of ways that you can. First of all, at the exits, there are boxes where you can put your gifts if, if you want to do it that way. Um, if not, you can always give online, and that's at fccwarsaw.com slash give. So if you're joining us on our live stream and you want to give, that's the way that you can do that today. A couple of things I need to make you aware of. First of all, next week is Family Worship Sunday. You are not going to want to miss out on this. We're going to be here together, uh, kids and adults alike, all going to be gathered together here in worship. It's going to be a fun time. Bob Jones is going to be bringing our message that day. You will not want to miss it. It is going to be a little bit different, so that will be really fun. And second of all, if you are curious about what it means to be a member here at First Christian Church and uh, – and, and you are kind of seeking out that information, there is something that is for you called First Step. That's happening on April 14th, so two weeks from today, and that's going to happen right after this service. And what that is is an opportunity for you to, like I said, find out more about the church, what we're all about, where we've been, where we're going, and you'll get an opportunity to meet some of our staff, some of our elders, and, of course, you get a free lunch, so you will not want to miss out on that opportunity. Now, what we celebrate here today is the greatest news that we have ever been given. And I want you to imagine for a moment. Picture up. What's that? Picture up. You're a picture up. <laughs> she is a picture up though, isn't she? Anyway, thank you for that. Out here, I heard that in my ears and I got confused. Out here in the lobby is uh, a, a photo opportunity for you and your family if you want to take part in that. Um, to remember that you were here and that we celebrated Easter here together. That's what I meant to say. Thank you for reminding me. Now, on to the important thing that I was going to say, uh, and I've forgotten what it is. Hey, this is the greatest news that we've ever been given, that Jesus is alive. And I want you to imagine for a moment that today is the first time that you have ever heard that news. If you've grown up in the church all your life, you, you know that, that Jesus is alive. But imagine that you're hearing that news for the first time here today. Maybe it goes something like this. Watch this, please. Stand with us. Let's worship again through singing. Sin has no hold on us anymore. Let's sing. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my too till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my too. my name Yes. 
why we're here today because he rescued us from the chains of sin let's sing that right now i needed rescue my sin was heavy the chains break at the weight of your glory i needed shelter i was an orphan but you called me a citizen of heaven when i was broken you were my healing have are through Christ and through Christ alone. Go ahead and sing with Kylie here.
that he will bring me home and day by day i know he will renew me until i stand with joy before the Have you ever thought that communion was just strange? I would imagine it would have felt that way for those disciples that first night. What is he talking about? They might have grumbled amongst their voices. Drinking his blood and eating his flesh? And of all nights during the Passover? Maybe, there was, maybe they were so confused like we are the first time we experienced communion. Jesus gathers his disciples in the upper room to celebrate his final Passover meal. He tells them, I'm eager to eat this Passover meal with you. The feast opened with prayer of thanksgiving, followed by the drinking of the first of four cups of wine. They ate the bitter herbs and sang songs and ate the lamb and unleavened bread. It was all about the children of Israel celebrating God's deliverance from the Egyptian bondage. Everything seemed as it should be. This meal wasn't like our family sitting around the dining room table talking about the day's events. You know, they would have probably reclined on the floor around the table, sitting on pillows and blankets with some candles lit in the room. It was a moment that things would start to kind of turn a little weird. Jesus was about to do something new. He was about to establish that first communion that day. As Jesus took the third cup, he gave thanks to God for it and said, Take this, share it amongst yourselves, because I won't drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. After sharing that third cup, Jesus tells them he was about to suffer and says, Somebody in this room will betray me. This night would not end as traditional Passover meals had ended for generations. Jesus takes the bread and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. He takes that fourth cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. What was this strange thing that was happening that night? And what are we to learn from what Jesus teaches us in his instructions? Just as the Passover meal commemorated God rescuing the Jewish people from bondage, Jesus was foretelling of a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement that would be confirmed with his death, the shedding of his blood. But see, the story does not end there, does it? The grave would not have the final say. Death could not hold him. And for that, we are so thankful today. Jesus was tying this Passover festival to the most important moment in history. God sending his one and only son to be the perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God that would come and take 
away the sins of the world. And on the third day, Jesus would overcome that grave. Just as God delivered the Israelites from Egypt, so Jesus' sacrificial death brings us deliverance from the slavery of sin. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So on this beautiful resurrection morning, as we gather here today, I am so thankful for all that Jesus did because communion is so much more than a ritual celebrated each week. It's more than just something we do. Communion is about God sending his son, the perfect Passover lamb, to be sacrificed for the sins of the world. And every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we remember that moment in time Jesus willingly gave his life for the sins of the world. So today I ask you, what will you do with this moment as we partake of this communion? Let's pray. Father, we are grateful. We can't thank you enough for all that you did. Father, we thank you for Christ coming to the cross and dying for our sins. And we thank you today that we remember, we thank you for this moment as we reflect and worship. God, I pray as we will take this cup, eat this bread, Father, we will remember the true significance of this moment. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please open up your cup to the bread side first. Jesus took the bread, and he gave thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. Open up the juice side. In the same way, also, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. Stand with us again. Death has no power over us. That's what we sing about. Here we go. Alone in my sorrow. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope with no place to begin. Your love made a way and let mercy come. When death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed. Now ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Your grace, oh, your grace, so free, washes over me. You have made me new, now life begins with you. Release from my chains. I'm a prisoner. My shame was a ransom. Be faithfully born. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested, my life began.
Our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But it hadn't, this happened. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hell. That's when death was arrested and my life began. That's when death was arrested and my life began. For your grace, so. We're so, so very thankful for that fact today. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and be seated. Good morning, everybody, and happy Easter, Resurrection Sunday to all of you. When I was a kid, I always thought like Christmas was the best day of the year, right? You know, because you get presents, and I love all the Christmas decorations and all the songs that go with Christmas and everything, but the older I have gotten and the more deeply I've come to understand and appreciate what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, this is my happiest day of the year. This is the holiday I look forward to the most, and I know a lot of you that have been following Jesus for years would say the same thing, wouldn't you? That this is the day that brings it all together. We wouldn't be celebrating Christmas if it weren't for Easter, right? This is what it's all about, that Jesus is still alive, that he died and he came back to life. Jesus Christ is alive and he remains alive. Amen, everybody? Amen, and happy Easter to all of you. Hey, you should have received a cloth that looks like this on the way in. 
And I do owe you an apology if you didn't. We had a bunch of these made, and I have been told by our uh, greeters who actually ran out this service, which in a way is both good news and bad news, because we had 500 of these made. If we had 500 people already here in the room this morning, that's a really cool thing through the three services. Uh, I don't know what to tell you exactly to do, other than when we get to this point, maybe share with somebody near you, or if they're, oh, Calvin, you have some? Dude, okay, ah, that's why there were none back there. All right, if you don't have one, these people are going to be walking through the room and just give them kind of a nod or a wave and make sure you get one because you need one. See, look at that. Everybody still gets one, which is pretty cool. So you're going to need to make sure you get one of these. They're going to walk through the room. Just wave to them as they do. I want you to give this situation here some thought with me, okay? Here it is. Video surveillance cameras have revealed a pattern in the way that a male suspect leaves for work each day. Every day, he rides the elevator in his high-rise apartment building all the way to the bottom floor. But when he comes back home from work, he rides the elevator only back up to the sixth floor, where he gets out of the elevator and takes the stairs the rest of the way up to where he lives. He does this every day, except if it's raining. If it's raining, he'll ride the elevator all the way up to the floor where he lives. Based on the evidence presented, why would this be the case? Let me give you another one to think about. Anne is lying dead on the floor. There's broken glass and water all around her. Stuart is asleep on the couch, seemingly oblivious to the death that has occurred. How did Anne die? I don't know if you've ever played kind of thinking games like that with anybody, or uh, if you're a parent, maybe you've done some of these with your children, but generally how it goes is a scene or a scenario is presented to you, and then you get to figure out what's going on by asking questions that can only be answered with a yes or a no. And just so you won't be trying to figure these out the rest of the day and ruin your entire Easter, I'm going to go ahead and tell you like, uh, what's going on here, okay? In the first one, the reason that the male suspect would only ride the elevator up to the sixth floor of his building when he would return home from work was because that was the highest button he could reach on the elevator panel. He was a very short man. But on the days that it was raining, he would carry an umbrella so he could use the umbrella to push the button for the floor number where he lived. All right, second situation. I'm guessing some of you figured out the second one already. It might help you to know that Anne is a fish and Stuart is a cat. And the glass and water all around Anne on the floor are from her fishbowl that Stuart has successfully knocked over. Let's try one more, okay? One Friday afternoon, a man dies. That same day, before nightfall, he's buried. Early on Sunday morning, some friends arrive to his burial site to pay their last respects, only to discover that his body is missing. What happened? That's the situation that we're going to look at this morning. Some of you might be familiar with the show CSI, which stands for Crime Scene Investigation. This morning, we're going to do a little TSI here at First Christian Church, which we're going to call Tomb Scene Investigation, if you will. And John chapter 20 is what walks us through the evidence. If you want to open your Bible or your device to John 20, we're going to be reading from there in the Bible in just a moment. In that chapter, we are shown three different people who come to the tomb scene on Easter Sunday, and each one responds to what they see in a different way. Three people look at the same evidence but walk away with three different conclusions. There was an empty tomb. No one could deny that evidence. But what they needed to decide for themselves was why the tomb was empty and what it all meant. And in essence, that's the same thing for each one of us as well, isn't it? That's what we need to decide. We can all agree, based on whatever background we come from or whatever belief system that we have, that there is evidence that the tomb of Jesus Christ was empty 
on that first Easter Sunday morning, and it's still empty today. Again, no matter what your belief system is or where you come from, you would have to intellectually admit that, yes, there is at least some evidence that points in this direction because we have four historical documents called the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in the Bible, which all point to that. And there's some outside references outside the Bible manuscripts as well that point to the fact that there was a resurrection that occurred. So you'd at least have to give mental assent to the fact that there's some evidence that points to there being an empty tomb. But the question is, really, how are you and I going to respond to that evidence, and what impact is it going to have on our lives? So our first tomb scene investigator that's going to help us walk through those questions is a person named Mary. Now, this is not Mary, the mother of Jesus. This is a woman whose name was Mary Magdalene. She was a friend of Jesus and a friend of Jesus' disciples. And we encounter her and her tomb scene investigation in the first two verses of John chapter 20, which say this. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. She saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she went running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. So Mary is the first person at the scene. And from what we can gather from the accounts in the other Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, she went with a group of ladies with her. And here's the evidence that she finds. The gravestone that had been put in front of the hole in Jesus' tomb had been rolled away. And in particular, in the Gospel of Matthew, we read that she encounters some Roman soldiers who'd been guarding the tomb who have become unconscious and they're laying on the ground as though they're dead. And there's some sort of angelic creature or being that's sitting on the gravestone itself. Mary apparently gets one glimpse of this disturbing sight and she turns and runs. Her assumption? Jesus' body has been stolen. Grave robbers came during the night and took his body away. So it's safe to say here at this moment that Mary saw only the worst. That's what she saw when confronted with the evidence of the empty tomb. She saw only the worst. In her brokenhearted and already grief-stricken state over the crucifixion of Jesus, she assumes that now something even more awful has happened. Mary was somebody that Jesus had helped a lot, though, in her lifetime. The Bible tells us that Jesus drove seven demons out of her, so I can't imagine what kind of living nightmare that she had or how much better she would have felt after Jesus took care of that problem in her life, but I'm sure she was very, very grateful to him. And she stayed as close to Jesus as possible during his trial and during his crucifixion. When his body was mangled from torture, she didn't turn away in disgust. And when he was hanging on the cross, the lewd comments of the soldiers and the insults of those who would pass by, they didn't force her away. When they took Jesus' body down from the cross, she was there. And when they placed his body in the tomb, she sat nearby. And when the Sabbath day was over, she returned to the tomb on Sunday morning only to find that Jesus' body was missing. So to her, this awful situation has now just gotten worse. She's truly, at this point, without hope of any kind whatsoever. Man, our hearts have to go out to her, though, don't they? I mean, because of the, the obvious grief that she had and the deep appreciation that she had for Jesus. And in a way, we can probably relate to her, right? Because sometimes, like Mary, I'm guessing, don't we miss the miracle of what God is doing because maybe we weren't looking for it to happen? Maybe we overlook something extraordinary that God has done because we maybe weren't expecting him to act in such a dramatic way. So maybe in some sense we can relate to her only assuming the worst when she sees an empty tomb. But ideally our response today to the tomb scene is going to be a lot different than her initial take on the situation. So Mary runs and tells this news to two of Jesus' disciples, Peter and John. And the message was intriguing enough to provoke them to go to the tomb and see for themselves. They also wanted to do some investigation and see if they could figure out this mysterious occurrence that had happened. 
So let's pick up the action again in John chapter 20, verse 3. At that, Peter and the other disciple went out heading for the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and got to the tomb first. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then, following him, Simon Peter also came. He entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. The wrapping that had been on his head was not lying with the linen cloths, but was folded up in a separate place by itself. When Jesus' body was prepared for burial, like when his body was taken down off the cross, it was wrapped in a a great big sheet, really tightly, kind of like a shroud, so sort of mummified then he was taken and placed in the tomb. And from what we can gather here, as well as from some archaeological evidence of tombs that they found in Israel that, were, that are dating back to around the first century, tombs would typically be cut out of rock. They would have a low entrance, maybe a step down into it, and then a flat, smooth slab inside where the body would be laid. So Peter goes into the tomb. He stoops down, walks inside, maybe takes that step, and he sees the evidence Like the grave clothes are there. That great big sheet that they wrapped Jesus up in, it's there. There's no body, though, to be found. So he ponders the scene, but to this point, to him, it's just evidence. That's all it is. It's just evidence. Apparently, Peter saw only the facts. The old-time dragnet officer, some of you may be familiar with Joe Friday. He often repeated a now-famous line, just the facts, ma'am just the facts. And that's sort of what we perceive from Peter here as he arrives at the tomb. He sees some things, but he doesn't understand what the facts have to say. Some of us probably come to unusual situations believing that there always has to be an explanation for everything, don't we? I'm guessing that's how a lot of us are. We look for rational, verifiable solutions, and they have to fit within our own framework of how the universe operates. But it's tough if we have that kind of a grid to recognize something supernatural or even to believe in it if it's truly happened. Maybe if we have strictly a scientific approach to evidence, a resurrection isn't going to rank very high on our list of possibilities of what could occur if we walk into a tomb where there used to be a body and is no more. So as you yourself consider the empty tomb of Jesus, is that just evidence to you? I mean, is it just something that you can give mental assent to to say, yes, I recognize that there are some historical documents the Gospels in the Bible that say there is an empty tomb, but is that just as far as it goes for you, that you recognize that's what it says? To you, maybe, is there a better explanation than a resurrection? Maybe to you, as you've thought about this in the past, is it a one-sided story told by just a group of people who wanted to believe it and now continued to be spread by Christians who also want to believe it too? So maybe to you, it's just kind of a one-sided story that needs more brought into it to fully flesh out what occurred. Peter processed the evidence a lot like that at first. But his opinion changed later. And I'm wondering if that's you, if you're a just the facts kind of person and it goes no further than just recognizing that yes, the Bible says that Jesus rose from the tomb or rose from the dead and came out of the tomb. If it just goes no further than that for you, I'm wondering, would you yourself, like personally, be open to a different explanation? Well, there's one other investigator who comes to the tomb on that first Easter Sunday. And verse 8 of John 20 says this about him. The other disciple who reached the tomb first then also went in. The name of this other disciple is John, and since he's the writer of this account, the author of the Gospel of John, he's too humble to call himself out by name, so he just refers to himself as the other disciple or the one that Jesus loved. And in the verses prior, a lot of attention is given to 
the condition of the grave clothes, the evidence about the grave clothes themselves. And the condition of them is quite intriguing because in general, you could say that this tomb scene is very neat, it's very orderly, it's very calm, it's very serene. It lacks the evidence of anything related to violence or disturbance or break-in. I mean, in fact, think about this with me. If Jesus' body had been stolen in the middle of the night, would grave robbers have taken the time to take all of the wrappings of a dead body off and laid them there so that they were still there? Or would they more likely have gotten out of there as quickly as po they possibly could, right? So there's nothing here that gives any evidence that anybody was rushed by any means in, in stealing a body. If for some reason Jesus revived in the tomb, some people, you'll hear this from time to time, say that he didn't die all the way on the cross, which is honestly incredibly far-fetched. If you remember what we talked about from Jesus' scourging a few weeks ago, how if that alone didn't kill somebody, the crucifixion obviously would. If you've seen The Passion of the Christ recently, the movie, uh, you remember then what a scourging looked like. Uh, Jesus didn't survive the crucifixion, but let's say just for funsies that somebody said he did. Well, if he, if he revived in the coolness of the tomb and he's all wrapped up, isn't there going to be an, an initial shock that you're all wrapped up and that you're alive? And wouldn't there be a clawing and a scraping and a ripping to get out of those grave clothes? Surely there would be, but there was nothing like that that was present inside the tomb. John sees something very unusual, something strange has apparently happened when he looked in there. With the body gone, the grave clothes appear as though they've just collapsed. Like they're still there in the form of holding a body, but there's no body there. They've just collapsed as though Jesus passed right through them. The writer John Stott describes what he reads here. He says it's like a discarded chrysalis from which a butterfly has emerged. That's how he says that John is describing the burial clothes of Jesus. With the body gone, the evidence suggests that when Jesus made his exit, nobody, like I was saying before, was in a hurry. And John observes the empty tomb of Jesus, and he draws a different conclusion from Mary or Peter. And examining all this evidence, he suddenly realizes that somebody's fingerprints are all over the scene. God's fingerprints are all over the scene. And even though he doesn't fully understand the full significance of what's before him, the Bible simply says this to finish out verse 8 of John chapter 20. He saw and believed. He saw and believed. John saw a risen Lord. Mary saw only the worst. Peter saw just the facts. But John saw something the other two investigators didn't see. He saw a risen Lord. He saw a brand new day. And what was it, though, that John specifically saw that made him have such a different response? What exactly was it about the evidence that caused John to believe? Well, we have to remember something here. And it's helpful to remember what Jesus' occupation was before he became a, a traveling preacher and before he had a group of disciples that followed him around and they were telling everybody the good news. Anybody in here, what was Jesus' occupation before he became a traveling preacher? It's a carpenter, very good. Yeah, Jesus was a carpenter. And the writer Sigmund Brower says that back during Jesus' time, there was a way that a carpenter would let a contractor know that a job was finished. It was a signature, so to speak. So imagine it like this. It's a hot afternoon in Galilee. Jesus has just finished a project that he's been working on for quite some time. His arms are just coated with sweat and in the sweat is matted all kinds of sawdust. His face is flush with heat. So he takes a very welcomed drink of water from his leather water bag. And after taking that drink, he dumps the rest of it over his head and down his chest and all over his arms and gets all that grime off of him. And then he takes a nearby towel and pats himself dry before heading home. And when he's done with that towel, he folds it in half 
and then folds it in half again and lays it right on top of what he was working on. That way, the contractor, or whoever would come by later, would see that carpenter's signature and say, oh, that job is done. It is finished. The disciples of Jesus, pretty familiar with that carpenter's tradition. And on a Sunday of sorrow, three years after Jesus had set aside those carpenter's tools, John crouches into an empty tomb and he sees only the linens that the risen Lord has left behind. But then there's something else that catches his eye. And it's like the central clue. It was the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus's head. And the Bible goes to pains here to point this out to us as well because John saw it and he wants to make sure we see it too. Let's reread verses 6 and 7 from John chapter 20. The linen cloths were lying there like what Jesus' body was wrapped in. They were lying there. The wrapping that had been on his head, however, was not lying with the linen cloths but was folded up in a separate place by itself. I can imagine a smile crosses John's face and his sorrow suddenly begins to be replaced with at least a little bit of hope because as he sees the wrap that covers Jesus' face and he notices that it's been folded in half and then folded in half again and neatly placed on the floor of the tomb, he realizes the carpenter has left us a message. The work I came to do it is finished. So you got this cloth when you came in here to the room this morning, or maybe just now when people were walking around and handing them out. I want you to hold it kind of just in your hand like this, or, or just put it on your leg, or maybe even on the, the seat next to you, but just make sure it's open. We're going to give you an opportunity here this morning to have a moment with God. Just you and God. And through this simple piece of cloth, maybe for you to have a statement today that you make with God's help that fills you with hope and belief. A moment where maybe you yourself can also say, you know what, it is finished. The work that Jesus came to do, he did it. He has paid for all of my sins. And now because of that, the past can be the past, and I can walk into a future with hope. Those things that were not good, they can stay in the grave, and the things that are awesome that God has before me, those can be my resurrected new life that I walk into. This could be your moment to get to say that. Here's how it's going to work. In a moment, the worship team's going to come up, and Kyle Astor is going to sing us a song. So, uh, friends, if you want to go up and kind of take your places and get ready for that, please do. So Kyla is going to sing a song. And as she does, I want you to let that be a moment where you just spend with God. And when the time is right, just for you, you don't have to do this when the person next to you does this, but when the time is right for you, I want you, not yet, but at that moment, to take this cloth that you have, fold it in half, and then fold it in half again. Just like the one that Jesus left behind on the floor of the tomb. What could this say? Well, for you in your moment with God, maybe as you're folding this cloth up, this can be your moment where you say, you know what, God, there are some things that are going on in my life right now. Uh, they, they need to be put to death. And we need to get those things in the grave. And I want to be raised up to be somebody new today and walk out of here with a hope and a future that I'm not living with right now because those things are leading to either spiritual death or literal death in my life and we need to put them away. And God, I'm going to walk out of here in full faith and confidence that you're raising me up to something new because Jesus is alive. Maybe for some of us in here as we fold this cloth today, we're going to be thinking about something that happened some time ago, and it's just hard to keep it in the past. Maybe it was something that happened to you. Maybe it was something you were a part of. But either way, it's something that to you just keeps coming back to your mind. 
and it needs to stay in the past because it's wrecking your present and it's making your future awful stressful. So maybe for you in this moment that you're going to take in just a little bit by folding this cloth, God, we need to get that buried. It's over and done with. And I know that Jesus rose to give me a new life and I'm claiming that today. That's going to be in the past and I'm walking into the future that Jesus is giving me. Today I'm walking out of here. You've got that. I'm not going to carry it anymore. Maybe for you, as you're folding this cloth today, you've been carrying around a lot of bitterness towards somebody. Maybe somebody's really gotten under your skin and you think about them a lot and it's just causing your soul and your heart to turn kind of dark. It needs to change. Because for you, maybe that's what's wrecking your future and making, make, wrecking your present, making your future awful stressful. This could be a moment for you where you say, you know what, God, let's bury that bitterness. Let's put that in the tomb. And let's walk out with a new hope that you've raised me up to be somebody different and somebody full of life, not bitterness. For some of us here today, maybe the folding of this cloth is just going to be a simple reaffirmation of what we've believed for years. If you've been a Jesus follower for quite some time, maybe what you can be doing in this moment is just saying, thank you, Jesus. I reaffirm today what I claimed so many years ago, that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose again. And I'm going to walk out of here claiming that again, that that's the central thing in my life. Or maybe for others of you in here, it's just going to be a statement of thanks, of like, God, you've led me through a lot of things in the past so far, and I'm going to recognize that Jesus is alive and lead me into the future. Maybe that's what it'll be for you. Yet for others of you here today, this may be the first time you've ever made a legitimate statement of faith of any kind. This may be the first time you've ever reached out to God for something or claimed that you want to own the good things that he has promised for you. If for you that's the case, boy, this is a big deal. Maybe for you, by folding up this cloth, maybe you're saying for the very first time, I believe this stuff is true, and I'm going to let Jesus put my past to death and raise me up to be somebody new. Boy, if that's you, this could be a really powerful moment. It could be any one of those things. It could be something different. I mean, this is... This is your time to spend with God, so with this open cloth before you, and I hope an open heart as well, enter into this and see maybe what God wants to tell you about what he wants to make new and what he wants to make sure is left in the grave. And again, I also want to encourage you, don't, don't do this just for the sake of doing it, um, but if this is something that, that happens to you while Kyle is singing this song, Make sure you enter in and claim this today, okay? All right, here's Kyla. No breath he gave as heaven looked away. The Son of God was made in darkness. The battle in the grave, the war on death was waged. The power of hell forever broken. The crowd began to shake. Stone was rolled 
As you folded up your cloth here just a moment ago, maybe something really did happen here, something pretty cool. I'd encourage you to hold on to this. Uh, take this with you and maybe uh, set it on your desk or put it on your dresser or your nightstand or maybe inside your locker at school or work, someplace where you see this regularly. And maybe even later today, just write the date on it, uh, that it was Easter Sunday, March 31st, 2024. And Write what happened or what this means, right? Uh, if you don't want to write directly on the cloth, maybe just write it on a piece of paper and slip it inside there so that you always have this and you can, you can remember back to what it was that you were allowing God to put in the grave and what you were walking away new from. I hope this will be, remain to be something pretty special to you. Maybe some of you still want to process this a little bit of what happened with this or what happened here today, or maybe you have questions or you just want somebody to pray for you. We'll have one of our elders, uh, one of our church leaders over here under this screen in just a moment. You can approach him and he would love to pray for you. If you wanna talk about what today has meant, like with any of us up here on the stage, we would love to hear that and celebrate it with you, what God's doing. I also wanna just give a word to those of you who maybe didn't do this. Maybe your cloth is still open. That's okay. That's totally fine. I want you to take this with you as well because maybe you'll fold it up later today. Maybe sometime later this week. Sometime later this year. Who knows? But just don't walk away from the opportunity that maybe God has something really good in store for you. Something that maybe he's inviting you to accept that he's ready to let be in the past and to give you a life that's something really new and resurrected walking into the future. The cool thing about Easter is that tomorrow's never just another day. We always now live in a world with a resurrected Lord who's always available to hear us, walk alongside us, and if we're believers, even live right inside us by his spirit. I want you to stand with me now as we get ready to close our service, and I'll, I'll pray for you as we get ready to go. Uh, there's been something that Christians have done through the years on Easter Sunday that goes kind of like this. A leader will say, he is risen, and the people will say, he is risen indeed, right? So I want to do that. I'll say, he is risen in just a moment, and you all can shout back out, he is risen indeed if you believe it, okay? Ready? Here we go. He is risen. He sure is. He is forever risen, never more to ever die, and no one in here who is a follower of his will ever die either. 
life continues to go on in Christ and we have an eternity with God the Father because of him. Let's just take a moment and pray. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to worship together today. You are the one and only God. You are the one with this awesome power who's able to resurrect your son Jesus and to resurrect us so that we also never die. We thank you for eternal life, We thank you for a Savior who's with us every step of the way in this life. And God, as we get ready to go here from this place today, we know that those original tomb investigators, they didn't just let the evidence be the evidence. They became witnesses to what they knew was true, and they met Jesus just like we, Jesus followers, meet him personally as well when he comes to live inside us. I pray that we'll be witnesses of Jesus' resurrection the same way, maybe even talk about what it was that happened here in us today, the story we have of what's being left behind and what we're walking into by your grace. Uh, Give us courage to share those things this week. Give us ready hearts, hearts of compassion toward others around us, filled with grace and love and truth. And we are so grateful for this promise that we hold on to in Jesus that we know that he is always alive. And we pray this together in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. Amen. All right, friends, I hope you've had an awesome Easter. I don't know if it's still back there. I think so, but we had fresh baked goods in the back, so don't miss out on those. Spoil your appetite before lunch, kids, right? You know, so uh, coffee and stuff back there. Happy Easter, all of you. God bless you. We love you. Bye-bye. And don't forget, if you have uh, purchased flowers, here they are. Thank you. Come and get them. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when strife. Cease my comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ, I stand in Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless pain. This gift of love and righteousness. Light of the 
that darkness slain, then bursting forth.